Hello, Aaron Wills again, bringing you another reaction video on this Monday, the 7th day of October in 2024 at 6.55 p.m., along with welcoming you to my channel. Allow me to thank you for watching. Please comment, like, and subscribe before sharing this video and turning on the post notification bell. It would be very much appreciated. Thank you so much. So much. And now let's go to YouTube and find something to react to. I'm not going to react to another Daryl Brooks trial video. I'm going to go to a writing video again. I don't know if anyone's put out a, a recent writing video, but I'll look. YouTube.com entree. Uh, let's search for Jenna Moresi. I think she put out a video the other day, didn't she? I don't know. What we got under my uh, notifications? I think it's on the block. Let's see. Dimoresi. There she is, right there. Let's look at what she's got going on. Jenna Moresi. Search, not microphone. Alright, I am subscribed with the post notification bell turned on to Jenna Moresi. What has she done lately? What have you done for me lately? Uh-huh. Right with me, live writing sprints. I don't like real writing sprints. I want to hear some uh, author advice, author tuber advice. <coughs> author news, what? Side characters, all right. Do you have to? Uh, what? Round tape packages and possible burner products. I'm worse fantasy tropes. How about? Today I'm breaking down 10 more fantasy tropes that I cannot stand. Some of these tropes are problematic and should be retired completely. Others honestly would be fine, except for the fact that writers have done them to death. Now buckle up because it's time for some hard truths about one of my favorite genres. I can't uh, make it a full screen. There's no option on this. It's almost like it's a short, but I know it's not a short. Let's get to it. Number two, mates. I don't care if your characters are fated to be together, but must we use the word mates? If you're saying soulmate, that's fine. But mates, by itself, as in, you are my mate, they sound like dogs. Which I guess kind of works if you're writing about werewolves. But with fairies or elves or any other fantasy union, it's fucking gross. It just adds a very animalistic element to the relationship. Maybe that's what the author was going for? Maybe animalistic reads as primal to them? To me, it's giving bestiality. Today I'm breaking down 10 more fantasy tropes that I cannot stand. Some of these tropes are problematic and should be retired completely. Others honestly would be fine, except for the fact that writers have done them to death. Now buckle up because it's time for some hard truths about one of my favorite genres. Let's get to it. Number two, right. mates. I don't care if your characters are fated to be together, but must we use the... It is a damn short. I knew it was a short because I couldn't make it bigger. Mine's pretty short and I can't make it bigger either. Oh, uh, here she is. Let's find something else to watch. Uh, <clears throat> three book release releases? Wow. Huh. She's been a writing little beaver. Uh, 
I'm Today like, I'm yeah. breaking down 10 more fantasy tropes that I cannot stand. Some of these tropes are problematic and should be retired completely. Others honestly would be fine, except... Yeah, we're getting out of that and going back to it, I guess, because I got in a short. I don't like them shorts. I, wanna, I don't want to be... I got in her... I got in... I don't know how I got in there. I don't know how I fit in her shorts, but I did. I got in her shorts. Um... Uh, this morning I shot an elephant in my pajamas. How I got in my pajamas, I'll never know. Alright, here we go. YouTube.com. It's a wiener. Yeah, we'll go to the Daryl Brooks trial. This is day 14. Oh, I don't think I already did that one. I don't know. Let's see what we got. Get him rusty again, maybe? What is this? How about Hannah Lee Kidder? She's just a kidder. Uh, Hannah Lee Kidder. Search. I wonder, does she have a playlist? There she is, right down here. Looking as cute as Heckfire. Twilight Rewrite, that might be fun, except I don't know anything about Twilight. Never read the books, never saw the movie. More movies, maybe. I don't know. Is it a series, Twilight? I don't know. Mm hmm. Grease is the word. Did you hear that? I heard Grease is the word playing in the on my roommate's television. Grease is the word. Someone holding an apple. I don't want it. Thank you. I don't have any teeth. This is a book like Arthur Henley Kidder. No. It's not going to help me. This is her eight tips for writing convincing dialogue. Four years ago. Let's see what she has to spray anyway. Hi, I'm Hannah. Hi, Hannah. <gasps> I haven't spoken, I haven't spoken today. today. I, I forgot, forgot I sound like, like Minnie Mouse. Today we're, we're talking about dialogue, how to write it, how not to write it, and then we're going to look at a couple of scenes that my patrons sent in and see how we can improve their dialogue. If you'd like me to edit your writing in a video, go to patreon.com slash Kidder. Patreon.com slash Hannah Lee Kidder. I feel like someone has shoved a pillow down my throat and the words have to this. find a way around it and they're not doing very well. So I have eight tips for you. Number one is a little bit obvious, but write the way that people talk. If you can't imagine a real person that you know saying the words that you're writing in your dialogue, it's probably unnatural. New writers tend to think that they have to add some kind of element to their dialogue because they're a writer. You just gotta make it sound like people talking. That's it, that's the trick. Number two is kind of countering that. Your dialogue is not a direct transcript of a real conversation. I know for sure I've seen this. Hope I haven't done I, I couldn't have done this with you because I haven't been able to do reaction scenes for quite some time. <laughs> real quite life, some time. it's natural for people to stutter or use filler words like like, like, and so, and um. It's distracting and annoying in fiction. If you're making your characters stumble over their words, it should be for a reason, like they're nervous. If they're not nervous and you're doing it, it's gonna read like they're nervous. Even though dialogue like that is technically realistic, it's not gonna read realistically whenever it's written out. It's just distracting. Tip three, take your character into account when you're writing the dialogue. They shouldn't all sound the same. So consider things like their upbringing and their education, where they're from, how they spend their time, 
time, the kinds of people that they're around a lot. If you have a group of characters who spend a ton of time together, they're going to sound a little bit similar, but if they have very different backgrounds, they should still sound different. Tip four, realize that your characters are going to speak differently based on who they're speaking to. So a conversation with your grandmother at brunch should sound different than a conversation with like your best friend at a ball. That's a very good point. I'd have to agree with that. Are. Everyone code switches in real life, so your character should do that too. Tip 5, read your dialogue out loud. Hearing it makes it a lot easier to spot the unnatural bits. Tip 6, I have to admit I do that. I've always read my dialogue and the, and the script out loud. Not script, but the uh, prose and the dialogue out loud. I've always done that. <clears throat> now I know it's the correct thing to do. This is to write realistic dialogue despite your genre. In fantasy and science fiction, you're gonna have some dialogue differences. Like, you're probably gonna make up terminology and slang that's not something from real life, and you'll have different cultures and they'll all talk differently, but you should still ground the dialogue in reality. Cause like, really lofty or super technical language is not fun to read, it's not gonna be as engaging, it's gonna like, place your reader further away from your character because they don't find them relatable. So even if you're in a make-believe world, it should still be realistic. Tip seven is to consider subtext. Every conversation has layers. Many of them aren't spoken. Your characters might be talking about one thing, but they're meaning something else. Think about their relationship with each other, what they want from the other character, maybe some spoken or unspoken conflict. Think of the imp They all want pussy. If it's a guy and a girl, he wants pussy. If it's a girl and a guy, she wants to keep him from her pussy implications and consider how it's affecting what they're saying and what they aren't saying. Number eight isn't like directly dialogue, but it's super easy to fix with very little practice. When it comes to dialogue tags, can y'all calm down? Quit having characters exclaim passionately and ejaculate their words. Said is fine. Stated is fine. Asked is fine. I swear to God, if I have to read some shit in a manuscript, like, Take the amulet she gurgled passionately out of her mouth with intense difficulty. The cursed <laughs> scene from her past echoing in her memory like an Instagram boomerang. Shut up. I'm so tired. Anyway. Now we're going to look at a couple of scenes that my patrons sent in. The first one is from Squish, whom I love. Squish sent a short story excerpt of two best friend characters having a conversation on one of their birthdays. So the dialogue in this scene should be really familiar and friendly. Exus clapped her hands, her rings clinking together. She reclined in the windsill her backpack in her lap. Took her a moment, but she dug out a small mush cupcake. Her lips curled into a frown. Okay, that wasn't supposed to be like that, she said. But you see the vision board, right? The thought is there. I think I'm gonna make it a little more specific. Like, okay, wasn't supposed to look like that. Yeah, A plus for effort, I said. Like a C minus for execution. That's cute. Um, I'm gonna change like to maybe, just because like can be taken in different ways, and I had to read that sentence twice before I realized exactly what it was saying. A plus for effort, I said. Maybe a C minus for execution. Oh, shut up. Exit have shoved me. Happy birthday, dork. The oh, shut up paired with the dork is a little, I don't know, it's a little heavy-handed, like, YA friend. I like that. It is certainly YA, but I like that. There, there are two friends goofing around. It's a guy and a girl. But I, and that goes to what I said a minute ago. I think he just turned 16. I remember this. He just turns, turned 16 in this conversation. So he definitely wants some pussy. Friendship writing to me. I think I'll just, like, take out that... Exodus shoved me. You're getting the same relationship dynamic just from her pushing him. Happy birthday, dork. I might take dork out, I might leave it. I opened the used to be cupcake and Exodus fingered some icing from it. Oh boy, did she? So she said, licking the icing. What are today's plans, birthday boy? I think I'm gonna make it a little more casual. What's the plan? I took a bite and near melted. There were pecans baked into it. I don't want a cupcake. Oh, you know, I said, try to pass the chem pop quiz. It's just a little too specific for two friends having like a casual conversation. So try to pass the chem quiz. Wait, that's today? That just, I don't know. Something about her dialogue is feeling a little performative right now. Cause that today feels more natural. Reread some of drinking coffee elsewhere in PE. Oh, you gotta be joking. That's us too. Well, just like you're joking. Oh, Doc Keen asked me to help out Mr. Young's sub in second period. That's fun. Exodus fell back against the window. Mark, this is your 16th birthday, she said. What about it? Your 16th birthday. Yeah, I know. I was there for the other 15. Yeah, so was I. I like that. I'm going to take out yeah, because I said it twice. Okay. 
March is your 16th birthday. Yeah, I know. I was there for the other 15. So was I. She stood. Her docs gave her an extra couple inches on me. With the rest of her... Who liked it? That's funny. Outfit. Ripped wine red jeans. She said, this is your 16th birthday. He said, yeah, I know. I was there for the other 15. That's funny. Black and white checkered shirt. Black denim jacket. She sounds cool. I'd wear that. She looked like the poster girl for an all-black punk band. A band she admittedly tried to start when we were in middle school to less than stellar results. You've never done anything big on your birthday, man. You always play it safe. When are you finally going to take some risks? Do something wild. Get out of your comfort zone. Kiss a girl. Punch a cop. <laughs> the last sentence is funny. I feel like we need to take one of these other sentences out. I think I'm going to take out her calling him man. I'm going to take out you always play it safe. When are you going to take some risks? Do something wild. Get out of your comfort zone. Kiss a girl. Punch a cop. My face scrunched. I'm not trying to get arrested. Hey, both of those are wonderful feelings. Trust. I scoffed. You have not punched a cop. <laughs> it was one of my adoptive mom's exes. He was off duty. A cab. That's beside the point. Um, I think it would just be with one of my mom's exes. Who calls their adopted parents their adopted parents? Also, their best friends. I think she just say one of mom's exes. He was off duty. A cab. That's beside the point. I'm gonna take out that. So this hey, sentence wasn't really a sentence. It was just like her rattling some things off. So we take out hey, that, and it's he was off duty, a cab side. What does off duty, like, a cab mean? With what her tone would be. I tried to start down the stairs. The bell would ring soon. That point being, Exodus pulled me by my backpack. You, Marcus Edmund, need to take a risk. A smile crossed her face, low and wide. I knew that smile. I hated that smile. And I know just the one. She said. Um. So ah, this is a comic place. Bastards. So that's what it stands for. Exodus said. Pulling me by my backpack fixes that. I think that's done. The huh. next scene is from my patron Owen science fiction novel. It should be a little more tense. I remember this one too. And it bored the skin off me. The skin grew back, in case you're wondering. That is, by the way, the largest organ on your body, the skin. Mine grew back, luckily. Because this bored the skin right off of me. Watch because the characters have just escaped like a space attack or something. So there should be more tension in the dialogue in this scene than there was in Squishes. Rogar sighed and closed the door of the microwave oven. Close the microwave oven. Um, that's not dialogue, but I'm editing it. Oops. He checked the appliances of the Centurion's makeshift kitchen, each device failing to start. About... He checked. And each... He checked every appliance of the Centurion's makeshift kitchen and each failed to start. Of all things to break when we got hit, Rogar said. He turned to Jackson and Kate. Cold stuff from a can for the foreseeable. I'll figure out what's wrong eventually. This is very explainy. Like, I feel like this is unnatural because it's just a lot of detail for someone to say to other people who know what's going on. Cheers. So, fall of things to break. Canned dinners for the foreseeable. I'll figure out what's wrong eventually. I'll take that out too. Kate shrugged. Had worse. From what I've seen, it's often like a reflex to drop the word I in dialogue. Uh, for new writers, they'll do that pretty often. But Kate might just be a really short person, so I'll leave that. The word I can't pronounce. Two newest crew members sat around a multi-purpose table. The living space at the back of the ship, cluttered in a need of several washes, hummed quietly as the engines below did their job. Rogar activated the console on his side of the table and a holographic map of border space appeared between them all. Rogar, Jackson said, I'm sorry about before. So, the place that you put the dialogue tag, it kind of puts a little uh, pause in it, and I feel like it'd be more natural. Sai, can you scratch yourself later? Mm -hmm. I feel like the pause would be more natural after I'm sorry. Rogar, I'm sorry, Jackson said, about before. For missing those shots, Rogar tapped the console buttons and kept his head down. No, the stuff on Emeros. I know what you meant. Um, I'm going to put the word mean in this sentence just for him to be like repeating what he said. And also this is two hyphens, so in Microsoft Word to make two hyphens on M dash, you just probably a better way to do that, but that's the way I do it. I mean the stuff on Amaros. I know what you meant. Rogar raised his head and sent a cold stare through the hologram. You're fine, Jackson. Not like you'd have made a difference anyway. There are not a lot of times that people will actually say someone's name out loud. 
I'll leave it there because he's like directly addressing him and they weren't already speaking. But for him to say his name again here didn't seem really natural. I know what you meant. Rogar raised his head and sent a cold stare through the hologram. You're fine, not like you'd made a difference anyway. Rogar soaked up the awkward silence. He loaded an image of a star system, the flickering hologram zoomed in on a warm, watery world with long chains of islands. We'll go here, Rogar pointed to the planet. My skin is melting again. And dawdled around the table. I don't know how I feel about that verb, um, but it's not dialogue, I'll leave it. Sagan's far enough from the border for us to not get caught up in what will no doubt be what you people call a shit show after what happened at the forge. Our jump drive can get us there in a day or two, but the interval lengths might have to vary. It needs a new pump. This is a lot. Um, let's see. Sagan's far enough from the border for us not to not get caught. This is a split infinitive, but it's in dialogue, so you're allowed to be as grammatically incorrect a dialogue as you'd like. I, I think it just makes the sentence clunkier. So I'm going to fix it just because hey Google. I feel like it would read Let's better. Let's say split infinitive. Not to get caught up in what will no doubt... Um, I don't know what like you people is referring to, but I'm going to take it out anyway. So that might be something that's important to the story, but I don't know what else is happening in the story, and I'm just going to take it out for the sake of cleaner dialogue. Sagan's far enough from the border for us not to get caught up in what will... In, in a shit show after what happened at the forge. Our jump drive. I don't know what a jump drive is in this context, but I'm still going to take jump out because I feel like drive is probably something they'd call it casually. Our drive can get us there in a day or two, but interval lengths might have to vary. I'm going to take half two out. Needs a new pump. Why not Demeter? Demeter, Kate asked. Ellen and I just came from there, Rogar said. Can't we go back? We could, Rogar carried on. Mm. Food. But Demeter is closer to the forge than any other inhabited system. People are probably flocking to there. We take out two. And besides, Ellen and I aren't exactly well liked there right now. We have a repetition of there that I don't really like. I'm really just say right now. I'm gonna take out and as well. Besides, Ellen and I aren't exactly well liked right now. And I'm going to take out So It's, since it's Kate's dialogue, and she was, like, really short up here. So if that's a characteristic, this feels more natural for her. It's a better choice. Rogar turned off the hologram. So I feel like he's... I don't know what happened, but he's, like, annoyed at Jackson up there. And, like, stuff on their ship isn't working. So I feel like he's annoyed, and this is... I'm annoyed at Jackson, too. Damn Jackson. That flippin' Jackson, I'm pissed. It's kind of wordy for someone who's in like a bad mood, so I might just put, yep. Yeah. Okay, so some of the things I changed might be wrong, considering other parts of the story, but I don't know what happens in the rest of the story, so this is just editing for what I feel like is um, realistic dialogue. Okay, cool. That's all I got. Hope some of it was helpful for you. Thanks for watching. If you'd like me to edit something that you've written in a video, go to patreon.com slash kitter. And thank you to my patrons for sponsoring this video, especially Owen and Squish. If you like their writing, I'm linking their socials in the description so you can check them out. Mm, yep, see you next week. Bye. Owen and Squish. I like Squish. It's almost cuter in the, on the left than she is in the picture where she's all dialed up. Publishing content. Work and play. What is this? Now? Without. Oh, I'm gonna have to choose. What is this? Tips for writing the first scene of your book, I guess, huh? Hanley Killer again. Hey, I'm Hannah. I'm a writer. Hi. I'm a teacher. I'm a bitch. I'm a lover. I'm a child. <laughs> No. So today we're talking uh -huh. about how to write the opening scene of a novel. These tips could also apply to short stories and other things, but I've got novels and long form stories in mind. So I have six tips for you and then we're going to look at some examples. First off, you've probably heard the phrase start late and end early in terms of when to begin and finish your story. And I totally agree with that. It's so much better to leave your readers wanting more rather than like bog them down with a ton of information that they'll either skim or like even find boring enough not to finish reading the story at all. So you want to drop your reader 
later into the middle of the action. You can give background information later, and if you can skip writing a prologue, I beg you to do it. Especially for emerging writers who are just submitting their manuscripts to agents. Prologues look weak, they're less interesting, they're often completely unnecessary. Most readers will skim or skip them. So start with your story if you can, and start in the middle of something. We don't need to know everything about your character or your world immediately. I haven't read the Witcher books um, yet, they're on my list, but I've been watching the TV series, and there's a great lesson in that show about how to start a story. Like, they don't give you a bunch of background information, they really don't explain anything at any point. They just snatch the viewer in immediately, with Geralt fighting that monster. Then you're just dragged through this fantasy universe, and you learn, like, the rules and the magic system and the characters as you go along. I love this series, I've seen it multiple times. I don't think there's a boring moment in it, because they're not spoon-feeding the audience anything. You have to be actively consuming the story and that makes it so much more interesting and it leaves the room for layers of subtext. So start your story with your story and leave the exposition for later. The second thing you want to make sure you emphasize in your opening scene is the setting. The reader should know what world and era your story is set in really quickly. This doesn't mean dropping a ton of exposition. It means choosing a scene in your story that is both interesting and grounding in the world that the story takes place in. Like I've read manuscripts that were deep fantasy fantasy or sci-fi or contemporary fantasy and I didn't realize until like the third or fourth chapter. You need to ground the reader way sooner than that. What's up? Vroom. Even if it's not all super uh -huh. duper clear in the first scene, in the first or second chapter, you should have already set up the rules that your universe is going to follow. And by rules, I mean that we know what's going on with the magical element. So say you have a contemporary <laughs> fantasy and everything is exactly as it is in reality. I like that. Look at their shirt. It says Dr. Pepper is a woman. I get it. Speaking of Dr. Pepper, there's Diet Dr. Pepper. If Dr. Pepper is a woman, she's probably on a diet. Reality, except animals can talk. We need to know immediately that animals can talk, and you can't throw in like two thirds of the way through the book that people can also fly. Like if you have a character in a situation and you get them out of it by them flying away, like where'd that come from? It ruins the suspension of disbelief, and it also just makes your story harder to connect with because your audience doesn't feel like you're being honest to them. Like because now anything can happen, so you kind of lose your reader's trust in a way. The rules of your universe are basically. What, what level of, of unrealistic, unrealistic is it? And, and then what, what are the circumstances and limitation of your magic system if you have one? So we should know when and where and the rules of your universe like as soon as possible. The third thing is your character. Who's your character? We should kind of see what they're up to and know who they are at the beginning of the story. You want your reader to have something to connect with as soon as possible. So your opening scene should be something that's characterizing. We should learn the basics of your character, like the important aspects of their personality and maybe like what their driving force is and what they want really early in the story. And yes, you have your full story to develop your character and get your reader to understand them better, but the earlier on you can make that empathetic connection between your reader and the character. She's got good hair and beautiful eyes and a neat shirt. The more compelled your reader will be to finish the story because they care about that character and they want to see how it turns out. The fourth thing is conflict. We need some kind of tension. We need unanswered questions. You need to hook your reader, especially as an emerging writer, because you don't have that established trust with your audience yet. So you have to pull them in quickly. So make. You, did she say you have, a, you have to have a hooker? You have to have a hooker reader. I don't think hookers read very often, but I don't know. I don't know. How do you get a hooker to read your book? Then she said you have to have a hooker reader. No, she said you have to hook your reader. I got you. Sorry, Hannah, the kidder. Make sure that whatever is happening in your opening scene is intriguing in some kind of way. This is how I've seen a lot of new writers try to utilize a prologue. They'll take like the most interesting scene from somewhere in their manuscript and just put it as like a flash forward for a prologue. When it doesn't actually serve any purpose, it's kind of just the easy way out of writing an interesting opening scene. That's not the solution. Because again, most readers will skim or skip your prologue. So that's just kind of the lazy way out and we don't want to do that. Your opening scene should have enough tension that it's interesting on its own. The fifth thing is avoiding too much exposition. The reader just does not care yet. If it isn't interesting, just save it and like push it back until it's crucial to reveal. I have a video all about how to like naturally include exposition in your writing if you want to check that out. My sixth tip is to avoid having too much happening at once. I read some advice, I can never remember by whom or where, but they said something to the effect of 
picking a sustainable moment. So what's a scene that can go on for several pages without needing a lot of exposition and without having to like hop to a different scene? So your first scene should be chunky with interesting things about your character. It should ground us in the setting. I can hear my phone, but I can't see it. You listen to Jimmy, but you don't hear Jimmy. Alright, let's finish, finish this in hand later. I'm gonna hang it up. Thing really quickly, it should establish the rules of the universe and it should pull your reader in with some kind of intrigue. So for these videos, I like to have my patrons send me excerpts from their own writing so that I can edit it in a video for you guys. Thank you patrons that sent me excerpts. These aren't full scenes because I didn't want the video to be a thousand years long. So we'll just demonstrate what we can do with the first page and hopefully see how some of these tips apply to real stories. The first one is from my patron Maya. Thank you for letting me use your scene, Maya. Oh boy, get ready for me not to be able to pronounce any of this. Part one, Parvena. Why do we have a semicolon? Where are you, when are you, who are you? Answer these to answer your destiny. You must ground yourself to retain yourself. An ever-expanding universe teeming with life, a cluster of a thousand galaxies, one with spiraling tentacles of a million stars, a tiny system fed by gold orb, a planet mostly water mug. <laughs> Sounds like Earth. I am Parvana Najmi, daughter of Rostam and Hadiva, <laughs> descendant of fairs, a human, a warrior, a drag. The golden orb beams through the blue sky. That's the sun. Rippling the air in its heat, huh. sense of a dozen species of flower and a few species of tree bob along in the air while robins tweet in warning amidst the predatory screech of a kestrel. Green grass gleams and shimmers, wafting in a breeze, a breeze emanating from a large figure, an 18-year-old girl. Her chest rises and falls, lifting her lavender robes, her eyes tight shut. They're arriving tonight, I wouldn't worry. Her nostrils flares, her father's voice resonates in her memory, and she resumes her stance. Her thick legs spread apart and bent. Her bare what? sepia feet clutching the soil and her bulging arms held close to her belly rolls. Y'all, she's thick. Either way, I know you'll make me proud. I already have your pride. It's you I want. Her glistening brow frowns. Her jade eyes snap open, wide and piercing. My duty is to protect the city, then so is mine. She focuses on five straw dummies in the distance, set a few meters apart. Calculations rush to her mind, angle, speed, power. Her fingers flex in anticipation. Her muscles and neurons energized, but her mind empty. She makes her heart beat faster and faster, pushing her chest wider against her robes, pushing off the ground. She twirls forward as crackly lightning surrounds her massive body. She channels it all through her arms, steadies it with the other as she lands and blasts five bolts from each finger with a crack of thunder. The bolts pierce their target and ignite them. Parvana Nami, I don't, I don't know, exhales, her body glowing and her heart racing. She she stands fully and catches her breath. Sweat glistens on the blonde stubble of her undercut. She thick and she gay, reflecting the light beneath her crimson hair. I pray Roshana understands this. She turns her back to the dummies and strides away. Her mind is still calm. Okay, so we got a human warrior dragon princess, and she's demonstrating her lightning skills. So this is her father speaking, or her father's voice resonates in her memory. So she's remembering things that her dad said. Pardon me, but I'm gonna... Yeah. I like that we've got a lot of description here, but something about the way it's written just makes it kind of distracting. And we got a lot of semicolon. This phrasing makes me feel like she's like hiding her eyes, like she doesn't want to see something, but that's not what the rest of it tells us. Like she's relaxed. Using bold and prose super distracting. I'm gonna have her dialogue or whatever you want to call it. I'll just have her actually saying it out loud. Flare. Something about belly rolls just really makes her seem like a child or Hillsbury Doughboy. I'll just put belly, eh. I'm just gonna put sides. I think you get it, she said. I already have your pride, it's you I want. I can't tell if this is supposed to be aggressive or like she misses her dad makes her heart beat faster pushing her chest wide against her robes there's a repetition of pushing there i can't tell if she's in the air or st wait steadies up the other as she lands so let me just leap off the ground the straw dummies ignite parvana nom exhales her body glowing and her heart racing she stands fully right. i'm gonna take out reflecting the sunlight just because I'm gonna hang this up now. That's not what hair does. I pray Roshana understands this.